Welcome to the second of my two videos on hypothesis tests for differences and means and proportions. The first video emphasized the logic of hypothesis testing and extended that logic to the cases where we want to test differences in two means and differences in two proportions. In this companion video, we're going to focus on examples. But first, a quick reminder that all of the hypothesis tests we're talking about here have a common format of emphasizing standardized test statistics, either Z or T, depending on the statistic that we're using and the hypothesis we're testing. But all of these um, have a common standardized approach, and the sampling distribution provides all of the information we need to conduct our hypothesis test. Regardless of whether we're testing means, proportion, or regression coefficients, the logic underlying these hypothesis tests are the same. And again, that logic was emphasized in the first video. In this video, we're going to focus on the application of using the difference in two sample means to test hypotheses about the difference in two population means, and similarly, using the difference in two sample proportions to test differences in two population proportions. Let's do some examples, and let's start with the difference between two population proportions. So suppose a human resources leader is looking at some recruitment and selection issues, and as part of this, looking at the difference in offer acceptance rates between two different types of jobs, exempt jobs and non-exempt jobs. And notice that the offer acceptance rate is the proportion of new job offers to external candidates that are ultimately accepted by these candidates. So the offer acceptance rate is a proportion if we're looking at offer acceptance rates between two different groups, this is an example of a difference in two proportions. So to analyze this, we need some data. And so suppose the human resources leader asks an intern to collect some data, and the intern takes two independent random samples. The intern looks at the population of exempt job offers and takes a random sample of 30 exempt offers and independently of that looks at the pool of non-exempt job offers and randomly looks at 25 of those and calculates an offer acceptance rate of 0.7 in the first case and 0.8 in the second case. Do these data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the proportion of accepted offers differs between these two different job categories? So notice this is a hypothesis test. Do these data provide sufficient evidence to make a specific conclusion, that's an example of a, of a hypothesis test. So let's start by identifying this. We have hypothesis test for P1 minus P2. And notice that I'm going to use just generic one and two. So it's important to define which is population or sample one and which is two. And so I'm just going to follow the order in the problem and define population and sample one as the exempt group. And two, we will label the non-exempt group. And then we know that N1, sample size in the first group is 30 and N2 is 25. We know the sample proportions that were found in each of those samples, 0 0.7, and 0 0.8. And lastly, it will be useful as we go along to think about how many observations are in each category. Notice we essentially have four different cells. We have exempt offers that were accepted and not accepted. We have non-exempt offers that were accepted and not accepted. And so we have four different groups. And let's just quickly, because this will be useful later on, let's just quickly think about how many observations are in each category. So in the exempt category, how many were accepted? 70% of 30 is 21. How many were declined? Well, 1 minus 0.7 is 0.3. 30% of 30 is 9. So out of the 30 offers, 21 were accepted and 9 were declined. In the non-exempt group, how many were accepted? 80% of 25, which is 20. 
and how many were declined? 1 minus 80% is 20% of 25 is 5. Okay, so think of these as the cell size. This is a cell, the cell of accepted exempt offers, the cell of non-exempt decline offers. It's useful to know how many observations are in each cell. Okay, so now let's proceed with our problem. This is a hypothesis test for the difference in two proportions. We always start with a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. In this case, it's a difference between these two population proportions. Now, if we look at the wording of the problem, do these data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the proportion of accepted offers differs between these two groups? It's not looking for specific magnitude of difference. It's just looking uh, for whether they differ or not. So the null hypothesis is that they're equal to zero. Notice that's the same thing as writing P1 equals P2, no difference. And we're testing that against an alternative hypothesis that they're not equal to zero. Again, if we look at the wording of the problem, the problem is not asking is one group significantly above or below the offer acceptance rate of the other. It's simply asking are there differences. And so that's a two-tailed test. The alternative hypothesis is not equal to zero. So let's think about the rejection region. Okay, with any statistical inference, we need to think about the sampling statistic, sampling distribution of our statistic. Well, what are we thinking about in this case? All right, we're going to use the difference in the sample proportions to make an inference about the difference in the population proportion. And so we need to know the sampling distribution of our statistic here, P1 bar minus P2 bar. So there's a refresher of the details of the sampling distribution of P1 bar minus P2 bar. Let's skip down to the third one and think about the shape of P1 bar minus P2 bar, which is going to be important for calculating the rejection region. Okay, P1 bar minus P2 bar always has a normal distribution if the sample size is large. In the case of two population proportions, um, or two proportions, it, both samples have to be sufficiently large. The definition of large is that each one of these cells, each one of these cells has to have at least five observations. And you can see each one of these cells does indeed have at least five observations. And so from the properties of the sampling distribution, we know that this has a normal distribution. So we can draw a picture. This will be standardized to a standard normal. And now the next thing, so we have the shape of our statistic, which is a normal shape. And the next question is in terms of the rejection region, how many tails do we have? Well, this is a two-tailed test. And so we want to account for the probability that we have an extreme positive value of our test statistic and an extreme negative value of our test statistic. So with a two-tailed test, we always have a picture that looks like this. I should have added up here that we're using a significance level of 5%. So that means that we want to account for a 2.5% chance of having an extreme value of our test statistic above the hypothesized value and a 2.5% chance of having an extreme test statistic below our hypothesized value. So we take our alpha and we equally distribute it between the two tails. In terms of z, we can use a standard table of critical values. So we're going to use 0.025 because we have 2.5% in the upper tail, 2.5% in the lower tail. Um, as degrees of freedom increase and we get down to an infinite degrees of freedom, that's the normal distribution. And so this is the 0.025 column. So the critical Z statistic Z value is 1.96. And because we have a two-tailed test, we also have to include the possibility of being less than minus 1.96. So there's only a 5% chance of being as extreme as being above positive 1.96 or below negative 
And so we are going to reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of z is greater than 1.96. Absolute value accounts for positive values being above and negative values being below. Okay, so now that's our rejection region. Now we need to calculate the actual z statistic based on the samples that we drew. And remember, we're going to then compare that to the rejection region. If the z statistic based on our actual two samples is somewhere here in the middle, then we're going to say, well, that very well could have happened with sampling variability. The fact that we only have samples, not full, not the full population, that could have happened even with the null hypothesis being true. So there's not enough evidence to contradict the null hypothesis. However, if the z statistic based on our actual values of p1 bar and p2 bar up here, if though if that z statistic is above 1.96 or below minus 1.96, this tells us that that's only going to happen 5% of the time if the null hypothesis is true based on sampling variability. And so while it couldn't while it could have happened, right, it's not going to happen very often. The more likely explanation if we have an extreme z statistic, the more likely explanation is that this is wrong. And the true difference really is, you know, somewhere out here in the positive range or somewhere out there in the negative range. And so if we have an extreme z statistic only happens less than 5% of the time due to sampling variability, we're going to reject the null in favor of the alternative. Okay, so for that, we need our test statistic. So we have hypotheses. The rejection region. Now test statistic z, which is going to start with our statistics over here, the difference in the uh, sample proportions. And to standardize anything, we demean it. We subtract the mean and we divide by the standard error. Or since this is a statistic, we call it a standard error. And so we standard, we're standardizing this by subtracting the mean of that and dividing by the standard deviation or standard error of that. Okay, so two pieces of this are fairly straightforward. P1 bar and P2 bar, that's just 0.7 minus 0.8. And remember, this test statistic is if the null hypothesis is true, and if the null hypothesis is true, then P1 minus P2 is zero, and the mean is P1 minus P2, which again, if the null hypothesis is true, that's just zero. So the numerator is pretty straightforward. It's the, just the difference in the, uh, popul in the sample proportions. Okay, now it's this, uh, standard error that's a little more cumbersome to calculate, unfortunately. Okay, there are two different ways of calculating the standard error. Let me go back. Um, so the standard error is number two in the sampling distribution box up here. All right, so we're now trying to figure out how do we calculate that standard error. Okay, and remember, we proceed as if the null hypothesis is true, um, and then we calculate our statistics based on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So unfortunately, how we actually estimate the standard error, what specific value we calculate, is going to depend on the actual nature or form of the null hypothesis. So there's two different forms that we want to look at. There's um, is the difference between the two population proportions equals zero. That's case number one. That's the case that we have. That also um, second possibility is that maybe if we wanted to see if there was a certain magnitude of difference, then maybe the alternative hypothesis would be uh, not equal to 0.05 or something like that. Um, but here we're in the first case, and so we need to estimate the standard error, and we're going to do it like that. Now, what's going on here? 
Well, if the null hypothesis is true, if the null hypothesis is true, okay, pen is back. If the null hypothesis is true, then the two population proportions are the same, which means up here we really just have two separate estimates of the same thing. And it would actually be better to pool these two samples together to get one estimate of p bar, one estimate of p with a single p bar, rather than two separate estimates based on smaller samples. So you can see in the uh, estimating the standard error slide, right, we have this one p bar, which is the pooled, uh, pooled sample proportion, because if the null hypothesis is true, right, p1 equals p2, so we just have one true population proportion p. Here what we've done is we have, we could think of this as two small sample estimates of p of p, but it would be actually be better to pool these and think of it as a single sample of 55 observations and calculate one um, estimate of p bar. So to do that, um, right, we can think of this as actually here as having 41 total out of a total of 55. So our one estimate of p bar would be 41 out of 55, which is 0.745. Um, okay, so that's why that's how this table gets handy as well. Right, we're really just combining these two cells over the total. Uh, sample size if we had pooled these two together and we get one pooled estimate of 0.745. And so then, where do we want to do it? Then, SP bar 1 minus 2, right, is P bar 1, sorry, just P bar 1 minus P bar. times that, which is just what's written on the slide right there. Okay, and so now we have our single estimate, better pooled estimate of p bar, so we can calculate this as 745 times 1 minus 745 over times 1 over 30 plus 1 over 25, right? That's getting to be a mess, but it's just 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2, this whole thing, square root. And if we do that, we get a standard error of 0.118. So again, this is where the calculations start to get more cumbersome, uh, starts to get more detailed, but don't let all this detail throw you off of the logic of hypothesis testing. The logic of this is the same as all of the other hypothesis tests that we're doing, it's just the calculation gets more cumbersome here. Okay, but now that we have the standard error, don't lose sight of what this is, right? This We're looking for the standard error of P1 bar, P1 bar minus P2 bar, so now we have that standard error, and now we can standardize our test statistic. And if we do this calculation, we get a z-score of minus 0 0.847. So we were going to reject our null hypothesis if z was less than minus 1.96 or z was greater than 1.96. Right, that is not the case. Right, the absolute value of uh, that's an absolute value down to one minus eight four seven. The absolute value of that is not greater than one point nine six. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis at a five percent level of significance. Looking at the bottom slide again, do these data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the proportion of accepted offers differs between the two groups? No, there is not enough evidence to make that conclusion. There 
um, there is sufficient likelihood of getting this uh, 0.1 difference, difference between 0.7 and 0.8, there's a reasonable chance of getting that difference solely based on sampling variability, solely based on the fact that we only have samples rather than the full population, even if the null hypothesis is true. Right? We're somewhere sort of in here with our Z statistic. There's a relatively high chance of getting two samples with that difference based on the small sample sizes we have based on sampling variability. So that's not enough evidence to cast doubt on the plausibility of or the validity of this null hypothesis so we fail to reject. Remember we never accept. We are not accepting the null hypothesis. We have not proven that the null hypothesis is true. Rather there is not enough evidence to reject it. Let's do an example of a difference in two means. Suppose somebody has created some kind of complicated subjective, obviously fictional, but some kind of subjective ice dam risk score, which is something that we have to worry about here in Minnesota. And suppose this person has made daily calculations of this score across two different winters and is interested in trying to test the effectiveness of two different systems for trying to prevent or lessen the risk of ice dams. And so in the first winter, so we have a number of observations in a first winter with um, an old ice dam prevention system in place, and in the second winter, there's a different ice dam prevention in place. And so is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the average risk score is lower in the second winter with the new prevention system relative to the first one? Again, this is worded as a hypothesis test. Is there sufficient evidence to conclude a specific thing? And we're going to use the conventional level of significance of 0.05. So um, we need to look at the data. Um, again, it's fictitious, but look at the data. We have um, two different samples. We have from the first winter, we have from the second winter, and I have this all in Excel, and so I created a pivot table, and so here we have the average of that risk score, the standard deviation of that risk score, and the sample sizes across the two different seasons. So again, let's start by um, identifying our, our problem. We have a hypothesis test for the difference in two means and try to get in the habit of defining what each one is. This, in this case, the numbering follows fairly naturally from the problem. Just winter one and winter two will be sample and population one and two. Um, we have a sample mean of 522 in the first winter and 498 in the second. We have a standard deviation in 1 and 2 of 140 and 212. And we have a sample size of, where can we squeeze it in? We have a sample size of 111 and of 98. Okay, so that's what we know from the problem. Let's now look at our hypotheses. We always start with a null hypothesis. We know we're looking at the difference in two sample means. And in, um, so we're not looking for a certain magnitude of difference. We're looking for whether or not there's a difference. So the null hypothesis is equal to zero. We're not looking to see whether the new system has reduced it by an average of 30 or 50 or something like that. We're just looking for whether there's a difference. So the null hypothesis is equal to zero. And notice that if the null hypothesis is true, that's mu1 equals mu2, so there's no difference. For the alternative hypothesis, now we need to figure out, is this a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? Is there a specific direction that we're particularly interested in? And in this problem, the answer to that is yes. Is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the average score is lower in the second winter? So that means we're looking only in a certain direction, and we're looking for u2 to be lower than u1. That would be a positive difference here. So our turn of hypothesis is greater than zero. Sometimes it can be a little counterintuitive because we're seeing whether the risk score is lower 
but this is a greater than alternative. That's because if it has gone down, the new one is bigger, so this overall thing would be bigger. Okay, but notice based on the wording of the problem that this is a one-tailed test because we're interested in a particular direction. So we had the hypotheses. Let's look at the rejection region. For the rejection region, we need the sample dis sampling distribution of our sample statistic. And our sample statistic that we're thinking about is the difference in the two sample means. We're going to use that to make an inference about the difference in the two population means. All right, if this looks really big, then that might be evidence in favor of the um, alternative hypothesis. If this looks small, that's not enough to reject the null hypothesis. Well, what's the difference between large and small? Well, it's the probability of getting um, the test statistic that we got just based on sampling variability under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So we need the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. There we have the sampling distribution of x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Let's jump down to the shape. And so the difference between x bar 1 and x bar 2 will have the shape of a t distribution as long as the sample sizes are large enough. And so the sample size being large enough is that the two sample sizes are at least 30. And again, we have 111 and we have 98. Those are both greater than 30. And so we know that we have uh, the shape of a T distribution. So the picture here, which has the shape of a T distribution, is going to be standardized to have exactly a T distribution. How many degrees of freedom? Well, it's the smaller of uh, the sample sizes, minus 1. So the smaller of the sample sizes is 98. So degrees of freedom is 97. We have 97 degrees of freedom. 1 minus the smaller of the two sample sizes. Smaller of the two sample sizes is 98. So 1 minus that, 97 degrees of freedom. Our rejection region is only going to be the upper tail because the um, it always matches the picture. should always match the form of the alternative hypothesis. This is a greater than, so we're only looking in, in this upper tail. And we want, and uh, what's the probability here? Well, again, we're using conventional significance level of 5%. So we need to find a critical t value here such that there's only a 5% chance of getting a t value above that level. Okay, so we use our standard, now familiar, hopefully, t table of t distribution critical values. We look at the number of degrees of freedom, which would be in here. Now we don't have 97 on this handout specifically, um, so the more conservative thing would be to round down to 95 degrees of freedom. You can see the difference is really small here, so it's not really going to matter. Um, but the more conservative thing is to round down if this is all that we have. Uh, a statistical package or Excel you'll be able to calculate the exact. And again, it's not much of a difference at this point. So the actual critical value with 97 degrees of freedom, um, I should have said we're emphasizing we're looking in the 0.05 column because we're putting everything in the upper tail. Um, and so at a 5% level, that is... Uh, 1.661. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis if t is greater than 1.661. Notice in this case we're not using an absolute value because we're not going to reject if we have a very uh, negative t statistic. That's not going to be evidence in support of the alternative hypothesis. We're only looking up here. Okay, so this is our critical region. This is our threshold value. Anything above this only has a 5% chance of being observed under the null hypothesis being true based solely on sampling variability. Okay, so now we need to calculate our t-statistic. That is going to start with our difference in the sample means and that's what we're standardizing so we take we subtract the mean of that thing and we divide by the standard error of that 
And so this here is just the difference in the actual sample means, 522 minus 498. And what about the mean of this? Well, if the null hypothesis is true, the mean difference there is zero. And then we need to divide by the standard error. The standard error is the square root of the two variances added together after dividing by their respective sample sizes. So this, we're going to look at the variances. You can see the pivot table down on the slide. All right. The standard deviation from sample 1 is 140, so the variance is 140 squared divided by the sample size of 11, 111. And the standard deviation in samples 2 is 212. Variance, you need to square that, divide it by its sample size. And if we do all of that math, we get 25.203. So that's what's going to go here. 25.203. So here's our t-statistic. Take our sample statistic. Take our sample statistic. And we take the mean under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true which is just zero, and divide by the standard error, which we just calculated to be 25.203. So our T statistic is 0 0.953. That gives us something like in here, somewhere in the middle. And so is 0.953 greater than 1.661? No. T equals 0 0.953 is not greater than 1.661. So we again fail to reject the null hypothesis at a 5% level of significance. So is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the average ice dam risk score is lower in winter two? No, there is not enough evidence. That doesn't mean that they're the same. We never prove or accept the null hypothesis. It doesn't mean that they're the same, but there is not enough evidence to reject it in favor of this alternative. All right, so could we have gotten one sample with mean 522 and another sample with mean 498 if the true difference is zero? Could we have gotten those two set that magnitude of difference based solely on sampling error? Yes. Um, and yes, with a reasonable probability. So there's not enough evidence to, again, reject the null hypothesis. So we can do this in, by using a dummy variable in a regression as well. So let me pull up Excel here. And so here's our fake data for winter one and winter two. We have um, the risk score, winter one and winter two. And now to run a regression, we want to stack it. And we have a dummy variable here. Um, we have a dummy variable here in column E where it equals one for winter two when we have the new system in place and it equals zero for winter one. Okay, and so we've stacked our data and now we can just run a regression where ice dam risk score is the dependent variable with new system being the independent, the only independent variable in the regression. And so here's the results of that regression. We've pooled all of the data from the two winter seasons together, a total of 209 observations. And you can see um, here in the intercept box, that is the estimated um, average score for the first winter. 
521. If you look on our pivot table results, it's 522. The only difference there is because um, in the pivot table, I just rounded up so we didn't have to worry about so many decimal places. If I had done the pivot table with more decimal places, it would have been exactly 521.6937, the same exact thing. And then how about our dummy variable? Our dummy variable is minus 0.23. Um, which, if you account for rounding, is exactly the average difference we found um, when we did the problem looking at the difference in the pivot table results. Again, the only difference there is rounding, and that's exactly the interpretation of dummy variable in a simple linear regression. New system is only turned on for the second winter season, and so the intercept is the average of the risk score, our dependent variable, the average of the risk score when the dependent variable is off, so that's winter season number one, so 522, and then the um, new system dummy variable captures the difference in the average, so the difference is minus 23, and if we subtracted that from the intercept, that would give us something uh, 498 plus or minus rounding, um, 498, the same number that we found in the pivot table. So that's the typical classic interpretation and use of a dummy variable in a simple linear regression. It gives us the same descriptive differences as we would get just by looking at the pivot table. Now, but what about testing the difference? Well, um, to test whether there is a difference between the two coefficients, right? that's the same thing as just testing whether or not this regression coefficient equals zero. I think we could rearrange these windows a little bit. Make some room down here. All right, this would be the same thing as testing the null hypothesis that beta equals zero. All right, so where beta is the regression coefficient on the new system dummy variable, if beta equals zero, then um, there's no difference against the alternative um, that beta is less than zero. Now this sign is different from when we just did the difference in the two means, but that's because the we've set it up a little bit differently and the dummy variable is directly picking up the difference and here we're looking for a negative difference. And so we can test this uh, hypothesis using exactly the results that we have in our regression output. See, we have a t-statistic of minus 0.9539, and there's a p-value of 0 0.341. And so would we reject, is there enough evidence to reject this null hypothesis? No, we could look up, we could use a critical value again, you know, and it'd be around minus 1.6 something, and this isn't uh, less than minus 1.6 something, so we would fail to reject. Also, we could use the p-value. Now remember, um, the default p-value in all computer output is for a two-tailed test, but we actually just have a one-tailed test, so our p-value would be about half of that, right? So our p-value is more like 0.17, um, but that p-value is not less than our alpha level of 5%, so again, we would fail to reject. So what's the probability of getting a dummy variable coefficient around minus 23? If the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of getting that magnitude of a coefficient simply due to sampling variability? Um, well, it's about 17%. And our threshold level, right, the level to which we need to rise in order to have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis is only a 5% chance. We're finding about a 17% chance. Our threshold to risk tolerance, if you will, level is around 5% or is 5%. 17% is not less than 5%. So there's not enough evidence to reject this null hypothesis. So again, we're getting the same conclusion um, regardless of whether we use it as a dummy, whether we test it as a dummy variable in a regression, or if we um, do it as a conventional difference between two means. Um, okay, now if we had the numbers side by side, the numbers aren't necessarily identical. There's slight degrees of freedom 
differences in the regression. All of the observations are being pooled, so the degrees of freedom are larger. Um, and there's a slight difference in how the standard error is calculated. Um, so notice on the screen, the standard error there is 24.6. And when we did it in the difference in terms of the two um, samples, we got 25.203. That's not just rounding error. The, the, actually, the standard errors are being calculated slightly differently. Um, but those are just sort of mathematical details um, in general. You know, and, and those details get smaller and smaller as we get larger and larger samples. And so really these two methods are equivalent, even if the numbers with smaller samples aren't identical down to, you know, the hundredth decimal place or something like that. Okay, so we could look for a difference in, uh, difference in means between two different categories by simply using a dummy variable in a regression. Now let's look at something else that's going on though. Here's another pivot table that I'd already made. And this shows us that, um, you know, we wouldn't expect the two winters to necessarily be identical. In the first winter, there was a, a higher average daily temperature. Now I'm not saying it's statistically significant um, at this point, but you know, on average, just looking at the raw difference, it's higher, 29 and a half versus 25 and a half degrees and there was less snow. Um, both of those would um, make ice dams less risky. And so maybe we'd expect the ice dam riskiness to be uh, lower in winter two um, or different in winter two because conditions were different. Um, and so how can we, we could also then think about doing a um, difference in the two means between the uh, risk scores between winter one and winter two, accounting for the fact that there was different patterns of temperature and different patterns of snow depth across those two different seasons. And so this is really a classic example of the power of multiple regression. We can look for an average difference in the risk scores by using uh, the same dummy variable that we've been using, but use it in a multiple regression where we control for daily temperature and snow depth. Um, so let's look at that next. And so I've already run that regression. Again, we have the data here where we have um, not only our dummy variable for the system and our dependent variable in terms of the ice dam risk score, but we also have some measures of the severity of the winter in terms of daily temperature and snow depth. And so we can run a multiple regression, which I have already run which is here. And now we could do the same hypothesis test for the difference in two means that would still be testing um, this dummy variable. If we scroll up a little bit, is it still there? Yep, All right, it's still the same format of this test. It's not necessarily the same results, but it's still the same format of the test. We're still looking at this dummy variable here. Um, but now in this case, so this is the average difference. Notice that it's gotten bigger. The average difference between um, the ice dam risk score in winter one and winter two, now the average difference is minus 57.8, um, a bigger difference than we had before when we control for the fact that winter two and winter one had differences in temperature patterns, differences in snow depth. Okay, and so controlling for these other risk factors or other factors that affect the ice dam risk score, we get uh, a bigger difference in the second season. And we can do the same test as here. And in this case, for our adjusted, think, we can think of this as the adjusted dip or the difference in the adjusted means, adjust, right, adjusting for differences in temperature and snow depth. We have the same hypotheses, but the t-statistic you can see in the output is minus 2.741. And if we have a you know critical value, again around probably you know minus 1.6 or something, this is significantly uh, lower than that. And you can see that in the p-value reported there as well. The p-value in the output is 0, 0 seven. Um, and remember, that's a two-tailed p-value. Um, we would divide that in half, so it's even smaller. 
right? So it's clearly less than 0.05. This test statistic is clearly less than minus 1.6 or somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and so in both cases, in, well, using either decision rule, we would be rejecting the null hypothesis of no difference in favor of a significant negative difference. Um, what's the difference? Again, the difference here is that we're controlling for other differences across the two samples. We're controlling for difference in temperature, difference in snow depth. And so when we make those uh, adjustments, when we control for those things, we do in this case find a significant difference between um, the average ice dam risk score in winter one versus winter two. And in fact, it's significantly lower in uh, the second winter. Um, so again, linear regression can be used, dummy variables in linear regression can be used to look at average differences between two groups. If we do it in a simple linear regression, think of that as the unadjusted mean. If we do it in a multiple regression, it's differences in the adjusted means, uh, where adjustment means controlling for other factors. In conclusion, you run into many situations where you want to make statistical comparisons across two groups. And whether we're doing that for single means or proportions or regression coefficients, or whether we're doing this for the differences in two means, differences in two proportions, which is the focus of this video, it has the same logic. So don't be overwhelmed by seeing these as completely different problems. Just focus on the logic and focus on how each of these different types of tests are really just variations on a theme. Embracing the same procedure, the same logic, just the calculations might be different. Now with respect to differences in means and proportions specifically, however, right, you need to remember that there might be disguised cases which are actually match pairs, so they're not a differences in two means or proportions. They're from the same sample, not two individual random samples. And I talk about this a little bit more in the confidence interval video that I made. Um, and also remember specifically in terms of differences between means, you can also use dummy variables without any control variables. This would be looking at unadjusted differences, but a, an advantage of regression over just a difference in two means hypothesis test is that you could also look at differences in what we could think of as adjusted mean differences. Right, so the difference between two means adjusting for other factors.